Big one, big one, wake up. Thank you. Perfect pronunciation, well done. <laughs> Hi, my name is Phil, and um, this presentation is all about data, and specifically data cleaning. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how some high-profile projects have failed purely because the data has been bad in one way or another, and then I'm going to spend the rest of the time to try and attempt to suggest some ways of, of improving the data. Um, this assumes that you've got a little bit of data science knowledge. Um, can I just get a vague indication of your experience level? So would would uh, you put your hand up if you think you have a beginner's level data science level of knowledge? Okay, what about intermediate level? Okay, advanced? Anyone done doing this full time? Okay, just, just one guy. Okay, but that, that's, that's fine, that's good enough. It just means that I don't need to sort of explain terminology and stuff. Um, okay, so let's go. So let's start by looking at some high-profile examples of where bad data has gone completely wrong, and it still is going wrong. You might have heard these all already, apologies if you have, but there's, there's, some, you know, there's some scary stories, there's some fun stories, and there's, there's well, lots of stories that are behind the data. The first one is a model that is used in, in the US, it's called the COMPASS model, and its aim is to predict the probability of an inmate, somebody in prison, of committing another crime. Uh, I talked about this last year, and uh, it was really, really interesting thing to look at because the way in which it used, it's used, it's used by parole boards to basically say whether you are allowed out of prison on parole or not. Um, even worse, it's actually used by judges in some, some states in the U.S. to predict whether you're going to commit further crimes. So you might get genuinely a longer sentence if you're being deemed a high risk by this model. And to cut quite a long story short, um, the... The fundamental problem with this model is that it's trained on data from the US. And the US criminal system is notoriously biased towards certain parts of the, the public. And the, one of the, the principles that they used was they calibrated the model. So it's a technical term, calibration. Um, they calibrated the model to be accurate ir irrespective of what race you were. Okay? So if you were deemed a high risk um, and you were African American, you would have the same accuracy as if you had scored the same number um, if you were white, okay? But the problem was, because of the underlying data, the skews in the underlying data, that it meant that the decisions that were made incorrectly affected African Americans more. So, in short, if you were African American, and especially African American and female, then you were far more likely to be deemed as high risk than you were if you were white, for example. Um, so that was one, you know, one part, and, and the reason why that, that was problematic is fundamentally because of the, the underlying data in the US. There's huge socio, uh, socioeconomic factors that, which are, uh, are causing more African Americans to be in prison in the first place and to be, to be repeat offenders as well. Um, but another thing that was interesting is not just the bias, but also the, the fundamental quality of the data. So this study also looked, this wasn't really published actually, this wasn't really reported that much. The, 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 the study looked at um, 400 specific individuals to check whether they had committed crimes in the future. And um, as, part, as a consequence of doing that study, they found that out of these 400 people, about 2% of the people interviewed had the incorrect name or the incorrect date of birth. So these people have been through the prison system with an incorrect name or date of birth on their record. And that was 2%. So two, there's about 5 million people in the US that are either in prison or on parole. 2% of 5 million is a lot of people with a wrong date of birth. <laughs> So, you know, the, so fundamentally the data is wrong and biased to begin with, but also it's being corrupted in some way. It's not being entered properly so that the links to the real people are not really there. Second one. Um, so this has been in the news uh, a couple of months ago. So Amazon attempted to uh, build a model that was capable of predicting whether you would be a good hire for Amazon or not. And again, to cut a long story short, there was huge bias in the data that they used to train that model. And... Um, you know, so the, fundamentally, the, the vast majority of people that are working for Amazon at the moment are all men. So using that data, it made horrific you know, mistakes when any woman tried to come through the system, go through this, high, this hiring pipeline. So in fact, they spent a lot of money developing it, uh, and they eventually threw it in the bin because it was, it was biased towards women. And again, the fundamental problem, similar to the, the Compass model, this parole model, um, the underlying biases within the data, the lack of data representing women um, was there. 
And finally, Tay.ai, this is a few years old now, but I still find it really funny. This was a project from uh, uh, Microsoft, and they were, they were quite brave. What they wanted to do was to build a Twitter bot, which was capable of, of speaking back to, to real people on, on Twitter. Um, the crucial decision that they made was that they were going to continue learning based upon tweets that were coming in in real time. And that was a crucial decision because in about 24 hours, it went from you know, mild-mannered to full-on apocalyptic, Nazi-loving, you know, end-of-the-world kind of things. So this was a, a collection of four tweets that someone put together kind of showing the, 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 the evolution of what this, this, this Twitter bot was tweeting. It started off okay, ah, blah, 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 and ended up with, with Hitler was right. And uh, after 24 hours, the whole project was shut down. Everything was gone. Everything's been completely erased from this. The website's gone. Uh, you know, the history on uh, anything on, on, on any Microsoft pages have gone. Um, so th this might be the, the, the only record left of it actually happening. Um, and that was all because, you know, engineers are quite cynical and sadistic and probably have far too much spare time on their hands. And they were trying to break it. They intentionally tried to break it. So there's lots of other tweets with just like A, 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 and just spaces and just dots trying to break this thing. And it turned out that if you just uh, told it things that you believed, it started to sprout those words back to you as well. So all you needed to do was just send it something horrific and it would send something horrific back. Um, so this is a bit more of a, uh, an interesting story, uh, but it kind of highlights a separate problem. So, so this is an app in the UK uh, they're called Babylon. Babylon Health, I believe, is the name of the company. And it's one of a number of companies that's attempting to build like a virtual doctor type service. And one of those services is the ability to talk to uh, a bot. It, it sounds like a human. Um, and it tries to diagnose what is wrong with you. Okay, so all sounds pretty good. And if you start reading the reports that, that they have published, or they published about a year ago, they you know, are sprouting lots of, 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 of uh, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to market themselves as, they've, as, the, as if they've done a really thorough testing, uh, a thorough job with the testing. So uh, the, in collaboration with the UK's Royal College of Physicians, researchers from Stanford, Yale, New Haven, lots of you know, buzzwords in there in terms of who they've worked, if, worked with to prove that this works. Part of this testing involved an AI taking a medical diagnosis exam, blah, 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 blah. Remarkably, and the, the key word is remarkably here, the AI doctor scored 81% on its first attempt. The average pass mark over the fast, past five years of real doctors was 72%. And this should start to raise a few question marks because the, the, the bit at the bottom there, the average pass, pass mark over the past five years is 72%. What do they mean by average there? So that, that's implying that they've, they've taken many observations and averaged them together to generate that result. And they're comparing it to a single result from this AI doctor. Okay, fair enough. Further tests that mimic real life scenarios were also conducted and when only tested on common conditions, the AI's accuracy jumped to 98%, compared with a range of 52 to 99% for real physicians. So this is, this is huge question marks now, red flags, alarm sirens going off everywhere. With a range uh, of, of 52 to 99%, they basically could have just said a range of everything from, any, from minus infinity to plus infinity. Uh, and then comparing it with uh, a single example on common conditions. You know, what also common condition is that a bruise? You know, so if you ask a bot, I've got a mark on my leg, it's purple and it hurts. If you just say it's a bruise, you're going to be right 99% of the time. And it, this was being sprouted by their, their PR and their, their marketing. And so obviously it caught the attention of, of real doctors. And so again, doctors, it turns out, are a lot like engineers. They try and break stuff too. And uh, a, a doctor in the UK, uh, was trying to find some interesting diagnoses. He, he asked this bot, a 66-year-old smoker is coughing up blood, energy and appetite, uh, appetite and energy levels are reduced and is a bit constipated. Fantastic. And um, so that could be, I don't know, I'm not a doctor, but symptoms of anything from a bit of pneumonia maybe all the way to lung cancer or anything like that. But the result came back is that you are likely in a coma. Ah, but only moderately likely, though, so it's okay. It came back with moderately likely that you're in a coma. And 
the reason why this is interesting is because about a month ago, all of this news disappeared, surprisingly enough. All of this information was removed from the website. All of the PR has been removed as well. So this is two images. This, on the left-hand side, this is uh, an image of the, the news articles that they were advertising on their own website. On the left-hand side, AI just beat a human doctor in a clinical exam. On the right-hand side is what it was about a month ago. You know, the, the, the stories have been completely removed from their website. So the, the, the news on the ground is that they have been in contact with some legal entity somewhere. I don't know whether it's their own legal uh, consultants or whatever, or whether it's, it's, it's some sort of governmental organization. But they're saying that if you are claiming to be more accurate than a doctor, then there's, there's potential there for a legal case to say that, you know, you trusted that advice, therefore you're liable for, for whatever happens after that. Um, so I think they've had to remove that because these claims are a bit too uh, egregious. But fundamentally, back to the data problem, this is very much, um, uh, th so the, the trying to diagnose a medical condition from you know, zero up to the diagnosis, the, the scope of possible conditions is so huge. You know, the, 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 the dictionary that has been built for all possible medical conditions is so huge and so overlapping, you would need a lot of data and a lot of information just to be able to fill in all of those gaps. So it's, it, basically, it's a really, really hard problem to solve. OK, so let's have a look at a little bit more of a, a practical example. And we've got Google Translate here. If I go to Google Translate, oh, I think it's, uh, there we go. And I want to translate, she is a doctor and he is a nurse. So I'm stressing the, uh, the emphasis on the, the, the pronoun here. So she's a doctor and he is a nurse. And translate it into Turkish, okay, it comes out as, oh, beer, doctor. Sorry, I can't, <laughs> don't speak Turkish, no beer, hemshire. Okay, if we translate that back again, so now I'm just going to flip it around. So I'm translating the Turkish back into English again. Look at what it's done to the, the, the pronouns here. It's swapped it round so that he is a doctor and she is a nurse. Okay, so this is interesting and this is a bit of a, an artifact really because Turkish is, is a, well, apparently I'm no expert again, but Turkish is interesting because it doesn't really have any way of saying she is something or he is something. It doesn't have any personal pronouns. They say things like they are something or they are, you know, they're talking in like the third person. Um, and so what happens is that when that, tra when that gets translated from Turkish back into English again, what we're actually seeing here are the, um, you know, the most probable result from the, the translation model. And these translation models are all built based upon something called word embeddings, and word embeddings are learned from real text. So once again, in the vast majority of text that these models have been trained upon, the, uh, the, 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 in the vast majority of cases, the references to a doctor have always been male, and the references to, to a nurse have always been female. So the bias is there every way you look. There's some quite interesting, let me just flick back to the, quite interesting research going on at the moment trying to attempt to figure out where those biases are inside the word embeddings. And there's similar things going on for different domains as well. Um, this, is, this is quite a complex table, but I'll try and explain it. So what, what they were trying to do was they were trying to find all of the, the, the biases that were contained within a word embedding. And to do that, what they wanted to do is they wanted to test the clusters that were produced in the word embedding against what people really believe in real life, the real life stereotypes, if, it, if you were. Um, so what we've got is that when you, when you train the data on, on this text, um, there's a lot of context around a specific word. So you can take a word like, uh, you know, cookbook or something in the, in the top left there. And there's, there's often names or genders or people, you know, that are associated with that word. So what they've done is they've pulled out those, those, uh, those, those words and then um, attributed them to names in, in, uh, in various languages and then asked people, so if you were given this set of names, would you associate um, these groups, this cluster of words with that type of people? So along the top, we've got the names, along the, the columns, and uh, along the rows, we've got uh, the, uh, like clusters of words. So the top line there is a cluster of food-related words, um, and, and uh, the like, third row there is a cluster of, uh, of, of uh, like occupations. And you can see that the, uh, the model has come out with a, 
uh, a, a lot of interesting and slightly dubious correlations between names and groups of words. And the, 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 the things that have been labeled in orange is where the people, real people agree with those stereotypes. So basically, um, if you've got a, a, you know, a name of Mia, Keva, Hillary, Penelope, or Savannah, then this model is, is likely going to predict that you're either a supermodel, a beauty queen, or a stripper. Um, so yeah, sorry if you're actually called that. <laughs> um, what else have we got? There's a couple of really... So we've got Kamal, Nalia, Kia, Miriam, Rohan, um, elder brother, dowry, refugee camp. Um, also, shopkeeper, villager, and cricketer. So, yeah, a bit of an interest. And there uh, you yeah, see this, this group down here has been associated with fatwa, mosques, martyrs. You know, so there's, there's really quite serious biases going on within this specific word. I, I think it was, uh, I can't remember the name of the, which uh, model they were looking at there. I think it was like word to vec or something. But this is one of the very common used uh, word embeddings that is used in, in basically all NLP models. Horrific biases that are existing in there. A related problem is uh, adverse, adversarial attacks. We saw sort of been mentioned a few times today. Generally, the idea here is that um, people are trying to exploit weak points within the model to make it make a wrong decision. And the only reason why it could do that is because you just don't have a full picture of all the data to uh, create the model from. So basically, there's gaps in your data that the model hasn't learned anything from. And if you can insert something at that point in the, you know, the huge multidimensional space, then it's quite likely you can get it to, to produce an incorrect result. So again, this is just a problem with bad data or lack of data. All right, one more, one more practical example. I want to show you. So hopefully, everybody recognizes that very famous photo. And I'm going to use uh, Google's. Cloud Vision API now and see what it makes of this very famous painting. Okay, and there's a couple of interesting results that come out of this. Come on, Wi-Fi, you can do it. Oh, sorry, I've got to prove that I am really not a robot, I promise. Oh, seriously, come on. Oh, did I? Oh, I must be a robot then. Okay, there we go. All right, so there's a couple of, a couple of it, it's a really nice API. It provides you with a lot of information about the image that you upload. You see that it's linked the Louvre to um, the, the, the painting, which is correct. But what gets interesting is some of the, uh, the more subjective parts of the API. So apparently Mona Lisa is neither joyful, sorrow, anger, surprise, exposed, blurred, or headwear. Um, so I, I'm not sure what that means. It probably means that, that Mona Lisa is emotionless. I guess, <laughs> which I guess is the, is the point. Um, I like when you go to the objects, it realizes it's a woman, but only with 95% accuracy, so it might not be. Also, it's a person twice, but both with 57 and 53%. Uh, we've got a couple of others. Uh, the labels, I think they're probably okay. And I think, uh, what else have we got? Oh, here we go, and the safe search as well. So it's basically very unlikely for everything, but it might be a spoof. <laughs> so um, so the, again, this is a similar kind of problem to with uh, what we saw with the, the adversarial attacks. So there's only one Mona Lisa in the world, so you've only got one training point there. What these probabilistic statistical models are all trained upon is having lots of examples of a similar thing, and then it can learn from all of that data. When you've only got one example or a limited subset of examples, it's always going to be hard to train these really complex models. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. So let's get a bit more serious now. Um, so a couple of numbers. So these, again, be, be very cynical and skeptical of these actual numbers because they're they're from management consultancies. So, uh, uh, but but generally, it's generally accepted that, that bad data is costing everybody lots of money. Um, I think that the, so 27% seems like a very specific figure for how much data is flawed. Um, but I, I'm kind of I think that's a reasonable estimation. You know, a, a good quarter of all data everywhere is is flawed in some way. Um, in a, a, a 2019 survey by PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, 300 executives from companies with revenues over 500 million 
the survey to find out how much data is, how much bad data is affecting their business. And they found that, that cleaning their data would lead to an average cost saving of 33%, whilst boosting revenues of an average of 31%. Okay, so various different sources are all reporting the same thing. Bad data is costing money. You know? And these reports are spanning multiple decades as well. And if we consider how much and how quickly new data is being amassed, then it can actually introduce a huge amount of technical debt. If you leave that data to rot, it will just never improve. Okay, so now I want to talk about why this happens, and, and then we'll finally get on to how we can start to fix it. So one of the general reasons why this happens is the way in which data science is performed at the moment. Deduction is the process of coming up with a hypothesis and then trying to find some experimental evidence to prove that hypothesis. That's, a, that's the scientific method. Most modern data science is actually performed the other way around. We get given the data, and then we try and build a model from that data, and then test that model with the data we've just trained upon, which is never a good idea. Um, so, you know, real science, Newton, etc., they all use deduction to, to, to do their stuff. But Sherlock Holmes is the equivalent. He uses induction to solve crimes. He finds all the clues, he puts a model together, and then, you know, eventually finds the criminal. But fundamentally, whenever you've got rubbish data, you're always going to get rubbish out. Or, well, we have to do some translation here. So garbage in, garbage out. It's in proper English, it's rubbish, rubbish in and rubbish out. Um, but it doesn't matter what you put in the middle. doesn't matter how fancy it is. doesn't, doesn't matter what technologies you use. If you've got rubbish ground truth, if you've got rubbish data, then you're always going to get rubbish out. A related problem is that the vast majority of data uh, is... Is uh, uh, it, it's, it, you can't really avoid this either, but most data is affected by noise. So noise is always part of the data that you're going to be working with. If I'm just trying to take a temperature sensor, if I'm trying to, trying to take a temperature reading of this room, I could go to different points in this room and get different readings. I could use the same device in the same location and get different readings. And this is because of all the noise sources that are involved in sensing that phenomenon. Okay? Um, if we use this data set that is full of noise to train a model, then we end up building a model that is also you know, working upon the noise and not the underlying phenomena that we're actually interested in. So we'll talk a little bit about how we can try and suppress and, and, and get rid of some of that noise uh, a little bit later. Assumptions about the data can go back to, to, to kick you as well. Uh, if we make incorrect assumptions in the beginning, then it can actually be really hard to... Uh, to fix that in, in the future. We combat our assumptions through a series of, of cynicism and skepticism, um, but also data cleaning, understanding the data, and automated tests. So just as a test of our assumptions and our biases, what is the deadliest animal in Australia? That's a question for everybody. Please shout out your answer. Kangaroo. Kangaroo. Interesting choice. Scorpion. Okay. Oh, you can, I, you can tell the data scientist in the room <laughs> when he's asking, hey, what are you comparing it against? What's your definition of dead? <laughs> humans. <laughs> humans, yeah, it's definitely humans. What's the, the deadliest animal to humans in, in, in Australia? Anyone else? Oh, good one. Snakes? Spiders, good one. Okay, it turns out horses. Horses. Between the year 2000 and 2013, we're responsible for 74 deaths. So as a comparison, the next highest was snakes. Well done, snake person, with 27. After that, it was bees at 25. After that, it was marine animals, specifically the box jellyfish at three. And a total of zero spiders. Sorry, zero spiders, because there's antivenoms for all of them now, and it's, it's quite easy to treat. There's also unknown animal or plant, too, <laughs> so I'm not sure. However, that is not to say that they aren't dangerous because man bitten on the penis by a spider for the second time. <laughs> poor guy, poor guy. Um, and the story goes into the situation where he was basically a construction worker, sat in a portal loo, got bitten from the side or from the toilet. But the, the bit I found the funniest was uh, at, at the end of the article, the guy was speaking and he was saying, um, that his, his colleagues, his, his workmates, they said they got worried the first time, he said, but the second time they were making jokes before I'd even got in the car. <laughs> so 
So it just shows you the humor of the, the Australians there. Um, okay, so let's, let's, let's move on to some techniques on how to solve this. The number one way of, of spotting bad data is by visualization. The human brain has evolved to consume a huge amount of information through your eyes and through your ears. Um, we might as well take advantage of, of those faculties to help us you know, find data that are going to break the model or, or affect the model um, before, we, before we try. Okay, A couple of techniques there. I, I won't go into them. But basically, if you can visualize your data in any way, in some way, it's always better than not visualizing it. A couple of um, data-related common problems here. So one common problem is, 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 is about data availability. Um, basically, this defines what you can and can't use, and, uh, it, and, and quite often one of the biggest problems is that it's sometimes it's as simple as you either have the data or you don't have the data. That's fairly, you know, fairly, fairly simple to understand. Quite often what you can see is that you do have some data, but it's just not in the right X. It's not at the right resolution. It's not got the required detail. It's not in the right format. You know, things like this. Um, so obviously, there's a bit of a trade-off there between how much data you can collect and how much you can store. Uh, generally, try and preserve as much detail as you can, because you can always abstract and you can always aggregate up from this detailed data. Um, generally, you know, storage is becoming really cheap these days, so it doesn't really cost that much to store that extra data. So just, just, just keep it all. Um, pres pre yeah, preserve versions. And the, the reason for this is that many data sets and many entities basically go through a, a series of updates as, as their life cycle emerges. So a classic example is like the, the order. Um, uh, if you're in a, a warehouse and somebody places an order, it can go through various phases from being order placed to order shipped to order delivered. Always try and keep some information about that history. Okay? Never throw it away because, again, that is detail that could be really useful for your specific problem. Basically, don't use CRUD in databases. Never update or delete. Just, just CRUD. Make it, make it completely immutable. Um, data consistency is always a real pain in the ass, and the classic example is, is timestamps and date formats. The amount of time that I have spent converting one date format into a bloody Python date format is, oh, God. It's, it, why is it a problem in this, in this day and age? It's a nightmare. But it can, get quite mo it can get quite complex as well, because going back to the order example, you can have different departments that might have different definitions of, uh, of like order complete. So the finance department would mark it complete when someone's paid for it, but the warehouse might not mark it complete until it's been shipped. And you know, sometimes if you've got like a warranty and somebody needs to send something back, it might not be really complete until like a year after, until the warranty's run out, because you can always get somebody trying to you know, claim some money back that way. And these, all these types of problems basically come down to the same point. Just be consistent. Be consistent across the business, across your data, um, and then you should be OK. Data leakage is the idea of accidentally including some information in your training procedure that is not available uh, in real life, not in real time. So the classic example is when you have a loan data set, and you're attempting to predict whether that person has defaulted on that loan. Um, and one of the features that you include in your training set is something like amount of money recovered. And so if you include that in your training set, then you're actually providing some information be because you only recover some money if the person is defaulted. So that's a very good, it's a basically a one-to-one -one mapping. It's a one, you could just use that to predict the, the default there. And that's data leakage. But some things that you often see that are a bit more tricky to spot are due to things like oversampling. So quite often if you're trying to combat class imbalance, you attempt to generate some new samples for the underbalanced class to make them you know, the same. But the problem is you're doing that artificially, so you're adding some bias there. Um, if you don't have much data to begin with, then you end up just making more garbage data. You know? uh, running dimensionality reduction or pre-processing on the whole data set and not just your training set. So remember, you're not supposed to look at the test set at all. So you can't do your pre-processing pre or or trading under that. Okay. This is where it starts to get interesting. So this is this is the the Titanic data set, and I use this a lot in my training because it's simple, it's emotive, but it's also quite realistic. The do the data is quite noisy. There's lots of missing data, and it's generally quite hard to work with. So it's a good example to use. 
Um, notice that there's 1,309 observations in this data set. But notice that for the age feature, it's about four-fifths down, there's only 1,046. So there's some people there that apparently don't have an age. What does that mean? Well, obviously, they have an age, but it's not recorded for some reason. Um, so it's an interesting story. So in um, so World War II, you know, completely decimated a huge number of cities in, in Europe. So a lot of cities were bombed, you know, quite heavily. And uh, one of the, the buildings that was bombed in London was a, an old archive, an archive building. And inside this archive, it had uh, original copies of paper birth certificates. And uh, one day, World War II, it got bombed, went up in flames. About 30 years later, my wife's granddad lost his original birth certificate and needed a replacement. Um, he, uh, he needed a replacement. I can't remember what it was for. So basically, he applied back to the government. Can I have a new birth certificate? And he got one back. And it turned out that his date of birth had actually changed. It was the wrong date of birth. And so he had this official document of his official birth. But I don't know where this got, they got this information from. But they basically regenerated this birth certificate, but with the wrong information. So overnight, he was now two years younger. And, and to this day, nobody actually quite knew how old he was when he died. Because his birth certificate said he, that he died when he was 68 or something. And... Uh, you know, he was probably actually more like 70, but nobody really knew. <laughs> and he, he, yeah, he, loved, uh, he loved playing on that. So um, we've got another interesting data point here as well. We've got the, uh, the boat feature. And there's only 486 of those. And that's really interesting because this boat field is actually a, an ID of the boat that that person was found upon when they were rescued. So this is implying that, uh, you know, if they were on a lifeboat and if they were rescued that's probably a really good identifier that they survived. So if we're trying to solve the classic problem of uh, trying to predict whether they survived or, or didn't, then we could use this information to help us solve that problem. So the fact that, you know, that there's, there's, uh, yeah, so in other words, the, the missing data there can sometimes be a benefit. It can sometimes be a problem. It just depends on the context. So how do we go about fixing this missing data? So Whenever you want to try and fix any data, the simplest and easiest and cleanest way of solving the problem is by removing it. If you can remove it, you're not adding any bias, you're not adding any of your own you know, biases into the data, you're not accidentally using an algorithm that can introduce bias itself. It's the simplest and easiest way of handling. If you can't, then you need to effectively go through a series of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of estimates, effectively. You're trying to predict what that value should be. Again, one of the simplest is, is something like a natural null. And that's, that's the idea. If, if you're looking at a feature that has this idea of nothing being there, then you can set it to that value. So for example, if we were measuring the amount of CO2 in the room, maybe NAN actually means zero. Maybe it just didn't find any. So you can replace it with a zero. That's like a natural null. You wouldn't replace it with a minus infinity or something, because that wouldn't make sense. You can do some sim simple aggregations there across the entire feature. You can take a mean or a median and just impute, just, just uh, set the value to that. And then you get a bit more complex where you're attempting to uh, model um, what the value should be if you, uh, if you had seen it from other data sources, obviously. A uh, good example of this is that the, uh, the, the American um, food delivery company, Instacart, um, they have a, a, mo a model that is used on their app to tell you when your food is going to be delivered. And so the way that they trained that model was where people, you know, oh, we just lost, oh no, sorry, I just went very quiet there, um, where they had a model that was predicted based upon when the shoppers, the deliverers, Joel's working? Oh, hello. Yeah, I, yes. think, I, think it's, I think it's working, it just got a bit quieter. No, if everyone can hear, it's fine. I, I'll can just shout louder. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so what, people would deliver the food, and then they needed to press a button on their app to say that the food was delivered. So then Instacart went away and pre produced a model to tell you when it was going to arrive. But they found that for a number of reasons, people weren't clicking that button on their, their phone to say it was delivered at the right time, because they had no network, they had no signal. Uh, maybe they just did it all when they got home on a night, you know, just click, 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 click. So in fact, what they had to do is they had to use the GPS data as a secondary data source to predict what the delivery time should have been and you know, compare those two figures. And so they were using a separate data source to predict what that delivery time should have been in the first place in order to make a model that predicts when the delivery time is going to happen. 
Um, so yeah, basically, uh, yeah, it's some sort of model, random sampling as well, and jitter. Jitter is the idea of just taking a previous uh, example that you've seen and just adding a bit of noise to it. Which brings me to noise. Um, so noise is tricky because you can never get rid of it. Um, I like to think of it as just weeds in your garden. You know, some people like those particular flowers, some people like dandelions, and other people don't. You know, they try and remove them. But it doesn't matter how much you remove them, um, they always keep coming back. So uh, I wanted to, to come up with an example of, of what noise looks like. Uh, I don't know if you can see that properly, actually. Let's just try and make that a little bit bigger. And I wanted to try and come up with a data set that helped me go on holiday. And I wanted to look at all the countries in the world and find out which were the nicest country to visit when you go on holiday. And so I thought I'd create a data set. I'll try and figure out whether they are rude or friendly to tourists. And it turns out that if you go through and trawl through all of the reviews, all of the messages, all of the trolling, basically every country in the world is both rude and friendly at the same time. And that, that was a bit surprising, because I was expecting certain countries to be like, you know, you go to Canada, it's amazing. But no, there's, there's rude Canadians as well. And there's definitely rude Englishmen, I can promise you. Um, so the, 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 the point of this, though, is I wanted to come up with a data set that showed noise in various dimensions. That's an example of a feature noise. So the entire feature is noisy. It's not actually providing us with any uh, value. So again, the simplest way of solving that is to remove that data, feature noise. Um, uh, another part of the, the, the data set that I was interested in was what was the, what's, what's the humor of that country? So I went again, trolled through the internet, and tried to, 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 to look at all of the websites that were mentioning the types of humors that exa existed in that country. So apparently in the UK, I think this is true, in the UK that puns, irony, satire, basically banter, um, you know, joshing, things like that. If you're in Norway, then apparently it's dark humor. And that's the only type of humor that exists. I think that correlates well to the amount of light in Norway. You know, it's basically dark all year round, so you might as well have dark humor. Uh, if you want to be a comedian in Canada, then anything against the USA, that will go down well. Um, if you're in Germany, then any humor is fine, but just not at work, because work is serious. Uh, and, and in Korea, apparently funny voices. They love funny voices. Who'd, who'd have thought? Um, but what we've got there is we've got this green band going across, which is representing observation noise. Sometimes an entire observation can be noisy as well. So again, we could delete that. But one thing that people often neglect is that the target variable, the, the target, the ground truth, whatever you want to call it, this is also, um, uh, this is also noisy. That, that, that is you know, being recorded in some way, and therefore it's a noisy process. It will have noise in it. Uh, and this is exactly why, well, is another reason why whenever you see anything close to 100% or 100%, then be very wary because the, the, the label in itself is noisy. So if you're getting 100%, it's a pretty good indicator that you're completely overfitting. Um, so the bad news is, is that it doesn't matter how many weeds you pull up, they, they keep reappearing. You can't remove noise. So that in, in literature and everywhere, the people talk about noise reduction and, and noise removal, and you can't remove noise because it's inherent to the, the sampling process. What you can do is you can kind of mask it and massage it and, and, and flatten it down. Um, some of the simplest ways of getting rid of the noise is through aggregation, through averaging. Basically, if you've got um, multiple observations of the same thing, you can combine them in some way to make a, a better estimate, averaging being the, uh, the, the most common. You can do some simple modeling. Exponential smoothing is uh, another type of, of, of model that you can use. Complex modeling, you can actually get a really complex model to, to try and do that. And uh, you can do some sort of dimensionality transformation as well. So one of the common, like if you work in audio, what you can do is you can take a piece of audio, you can transform it into a different domain called a frequency domain. So rather than just viewing it in time, you can view it in frequency instead then you can do some stuff in that domain and transform it back again. And it helps you remove some of that noise. Uh, and that's you know, kind of what, what word embeddings are doing in NLP as well. Um, how much time have we got left? So I'm at four, two, ten, minutes. 10 minutes. OK, cool. Is that including questions? Or? Yeah, OK. Um, so 
related to noise are anomalies. And anomalies are interesting because they could be interesting depending on the, the context. So on the left-hand side, we've got an example of an, an anomaly that is probably just noise. We want to try and remove that in some way. And on the right-hand side, we've got an example of an anomaly that um, is, is an artifact of the way it's been generated, but it could be interesting. And that gives us different types of anom anomalies. We get the contextual anomaly. If you're trying to um, do fraud detection, for example, the definition of a fraudulent transaction is an anomaly. It's just not normal. Um, so that's possibly a good thing to try and correct. But quite often, it's not a good thing, and we call it a corruption. Your data's been corrupted, and that can be due to anything from you know, measurement failures, API changes, regulatory changes. If you go from having no GDPR law to instantly having GDPR law, you know, huge, the huge uh, swath of the advertising industry cannot, cannot use the data that they once had, or not even use the same models that they once had. Um, to detect an anomaly, you know, this, basically, this, it all boils down to this. It's a big field, but it all boils down to define what is normal, define what is expected, and then uh, set a threshold to, to see something that's not normal. Simple as that. To do this for, um, uh, for, for in, in your purposes to do this, then I just recommend just visualize everything because it's much, much easier. It's much easier are much safer to detect that red point there, you know, that anomaly, by looking at it than it is trying to do it algorithmically. You can do it through the through through you know models and algorithms and, and statistical tests and things like that, but it's a lot easier to basically forget to do that and trick yourself that you're doing really well. So just visualize it, and it's it'll become really really obvious. Um, okay, so I'll just go through this one last example. I think I've got a few more slides, but uh, this is fine. Um, this is an example of a, another toy data set called a wine quality data set. And the most interesting thing that comes out of this data set is the fact that if you have a stronger wine, it is generally perceived to be of a higher quality. So next time you're at a party and you want to get away with buying a really cheap bottle of wine, just top it up with some vodka and they'll think it's really expensive. But what we can do is that this is a model to predict the quality based upon the amount of alcohol in the wine. You can see a simple straight line regression model. But you can see there's lots of data points that are you know, sitting out on the sides here. We've got one up here that could almost be considered an outlier. So what we can do is we can measure the distance from that model to all of the data points. And it comes up with a histogram that looks like this. And then what we can do is we can say, OK, everything that's plus or minus three standard deviations away from that line will remove it. when we do that. We get rid of all these data points here. Um, so, you know, a nice, simple, easy way of automating, um, automating away some of that noise reduction. Um, OK, I think I will skip through the rest there. Uh, a lot of these slides came from my training. So if you're one of the lucky people coming to my training tomorrow or the next day, then you might see a lot of this again. Um, there's lots of things I haven't talked about. It's a huge subject, but the main thing I want to get across, really, is that cleaning data is really important. There's a huge amount of technical debt involved there, and in a normal data scientist job, they're spending 50, 60% of their time working on the data and cleaning the data and moving data from A to B and transforming data. It's all about understanding that data. So it's a huge part of the job, but it's not talked about that much. So. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's the, the, the key takeaway for this. Um, yeah, it's open to interpretation, which is one of the reasons why it's quite hard to automate entirely. But it can be done. But I would always recommend going through it manually, visualizing it, getting your hands dirty with the, the raw material before you start doing the automation. And one of the main reasons to do that is because of all the domain knowledge that can be gained from looking at this raw data. So with that, I'll end that talk there and hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much.